Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is another one of the medical school application videos where I run through the application process for how to apply to every single graduate entry medical program in the country. I always say I'm gonna be applying to pretty much every single school in the country. Today what we're gonna do is go through the University of Wollongong, which is a rural campus or a rural school and uh, it's very much focused on regional settings. So I'm still in two minds about whether or not I'll actually apply to this one. Uh, it's a GEMSAS school though, so if you're looking at it, hopefully this video is helpful for you. And uh, even through researching, I'm still in two minds. I'll explain a little bit at the end about why that is. But um, if you are looking to apply here, let's run through the actual process. As always, I'm not an expert on these things. Uh, I basically do the research in the process of my own research for my own applications and I share it with you in the video format. People have found it pretty helpful, but um, I may be missing some bits and pieces. So if you've got any questions or anything, I'm happy to try and field them in the comments, but you might actually be better off contacting the university themselves. The other thing that you can do as well is you can contact GEMSAS if you've got anything specific but um, I've already gone through a lot of GEMSAS schools, so what I do now is just focus on the uni-specific elements of the process, although University of Wollongong is quite different from the others, and so most of the steps we'll actually be going through today. First, we'll break down the place types. So it's actually quite a big cohort compared to what I expected for a regional setting. This might just be because of the fact that uh, there's, a, there's a big focus on trying to get more and more uh, rural applicants into the program. There are 50 CSP places. There's also an additional 17 bonded places or BMP places through the CSP program. And then as well as that, there's another 17 international places that are full fee. Although University of Wollongong was also saying that they were in talks with the government trying to work out if they could get an additional 17 domestic full fee places, but I haven't yet seen any confirmation of if they got them. They were trying to get those for 2022 entry. And uh, obviously I'm basing this all off the 2022 entry guide and at that point they hadn't confirmed it. If anyone knows whether or not they actually have gotten those places, let me know and I can pin the comment for people. But uh, at the moment I actually don't know if they got it. So at the moment, a total intake of 84. So the main thing is because it's a rural focused uh, campus and a rural focused degree, they say that the big focus here is trying to prepare people for practice in rural and regional settings, or really they say any setting, any geographical setting, but largely focused on rural and regional settings. And then the other big difference is they have clinical exposure from the first semester of first year. A lot of other schools either do the first year as preclinical and you do all your theory. Some even do two years out of the four. This one actually puts you straight into clinical settings in rural hospitals pretty much immediately. So in terms of qualifying degrees, a lot, lot simpler, which is nice to go through. Um, basically, you need a 3.0 or three years full-time equivalent degree. It can be an accelerated degree that was done in two years, so long as it's equivalent to three years full-time. It must be completed by the end of the application year, so the 31st of December. So if you're in your final year, it's okay. You'll be applying and then get a conditional offer. We'll go through some of the details later on. It's pretty standard to GEMSAS processes though. If you've done a, like a conversion degree or uh, something similar that is two years full-time equivalent. It may be accepted, but they still do need to see at least a three years full-time equivalent degree completed beforehand as well. So then next up is GPA calculations. So GPA, they treat this a little bit differently. It's basically a hurdle just like Sydney Uni is. They have a hurdle requirement for GPA of 5.5 on the seven point scale. It's taken from the final three years of your bachelor's degree and or honors if applicable. So they do the count back method. They apply the times three, two, and one weighting to each of the three most recent years with the most recent year or the final year being treated as the most uh, heavily weighted. That's the one that gets times three. And so if you've done an honors year as well, that will be counted as your final year. And then the two years prior to that in your undergrad would be counted as your final minus one and, and uh, final minus two years. Otherwise, if you've just done a three year degree, then it's the, the three years of your undergrad. If you've done a combined degree or a four year degree, then it's the last three years of that undergrad. That's pretty much it. Postgraduate studies are not included in GPA calculations. So if you've done a master's or anything like that, um, it can be used for qualifying your degree, but your GPA always comes from undergraduate studies and or honors if applicable. And so then finally, as I mentioned, the 5.5, it is a hurdle. It doesn't actually then go into the ranking process for interview, and it also doesn't factor in for offers either. It's just a hurdle to meet in order to be eligible to apply. And then finally, COVID exemptions. So if you had any studies in that qualifying degree in 2020, all 2020 results are excluded from GPA calculation including the weightings for that year. If you've got results coming from an honors project or an honors uh, subject, results from a 2020 honors uh, subject, they still get included. It's only undergraduate studies where they scrap them from the consideration. 
the 2020 only, both semesters one and two by the looks of it. So they also apply the 10 year rule as well for currency. They backdate it from the close of applications. So you can expect that that is that you need to have completed that qualifying degree within 10 years of the 31st of May in your application year. So if you're applying for 2023 intake, you'll be applying this year, meaning that applications close probably on the 31st of May, 2022, which means you need to have completed your undergraduate. And that is, they say graduated rather than conferred or completed study. You need to have graduated after the 31st of May, 2012. That would qualify you. If you do have an older degree that goes outside of that, you can requalify it by doing a one year's full-time equivalent in a graduate diploma or higher degree within the last 10 years. Finally, if neither of those apply to you, you can still actually apply for a waiver, that particular limitation or that requirement for the 10 years. And as long as you can prove or demonstrate high levels of academic ability within some time frame up to application, they may actually take it on a case by case and then they may actually waive that 10 year rule for you. But you do have to get the application in pretty soon in the process as well, because they say that it can be slow and uh, if it's delayed for any reason, they can't guarantee anything, which means that you may it may time out. So don't leave it till the last few days of the application cycle. And next up is GAMSAT. They have stock standard minimum 50 overall, minimum 50 in all three sections. That is a requirement. That is the basic minimum hurdle. Um, but then GAMSAT still goes into actual consideration for rankings for interview. The other thing that they do differently is they also use the CASPER test as well. So some of you might already be familiar with the CASPER test. It's used. It's a situational uh judgment test or an SJT. So basically it gives you video based scenarios and then you have to respond to them in an appropriate way. And this is basically assessing your professional skills, your communication and your, uh, your judgment and your decision making in a professional setting. So if you've sat one of those before, then you'll already be familiar with kind of how it might run. If not, I'll link below and you can kind of run through it. I've never sat a Casper test before myself. So um, if I do go through the process, then this will be new for me. So the link is below, you can kind of learn a little bit more about it there, but that is part of the process. And again, they say to register for the Casper as soon as possible, they have a set window or testing period specifically for the Casper for the MD applications. And they say, you need to make sure that you've actually done it in that testing window or else it'll be ineligible or too late. And they use your Casper results for ranking along with your interview and your portfolio score for the offers, but they don't use your CASPER test for interview rankings. They only use it as a hurdle. It comes back later for offers though. They do rank you on CASPER results. So it's not just a case of passing it. You do want to get as high a score as possible because that will factor into a final offer. The next thing is they're also a portfolio uni, just like uh, Notre Dame in Fremantle and their Sydney campus. Uh, the University of Wollongong also run on a portfolio. So you'll submit one of those. It's an embedded form, just like the Notre Dame one in the actual uh, GEMSAS application. So you won't be able to truly submit it until GEMSAS applications open, but they do say it's lengthy and you're best off drafting one up. So you can start working on one now and then you can basically just paste it in as soon as applications open, get it over and done with. They've got a template on their website, which I'll also link below as well. So that gives you a sense of what you want to be drafting. They also say that you need to make sure that it fits to the actual format because if you don't follow the UOW format for the portfolio, they may reject it as well. So pretty much just work on the template that they've got on their website and then you'll be fine. They've also got a portfolio guide, which will help you with actually filling that in as well. Basically, you just provide a whole bunch of your different experiences that are relevant to the questions or the promptings that they ask. And they also background check. You need to make sure you have a reference for every single one of those activities that you list and you need to provide an email contact. They basically just use that email contact to verify the contact that you have and verify that what you're saying is true. So the next thing in the process is once we get all those kind of results and things out of the way is this is a uni where you actually have to give a preference for campuses because they have two campuses. So they have one in Wollongong and another one in Shoalhaven as well. Cool. And uh, you'll be based at one of these two campuses while you're doing some of the preclinical stuff for the first 18 months of the degree. So that is kind of how you factor that into whether or not you want to go with one campus or the other. You put in a preferencing system, you'll number them one and two, one being most preferenced, and they'll take that into consideration with how they actually allocate offers as well. The final thing is preferences are considered, but they're not necessarily guaranteed. So you might put Wollongong as number one, but you might still end up with an offer at the Shoalhaven campus instead. And that might just be down to where you're ranked versus where you preferenced it. 
Um, so they can't actually guarantee that you'll get your first preference. Same thing with place types. You also have to preference your place types between, um, if you're a domestic applicant, between CSP and BMP and full fee if they've gotten those allocations as well. Um, and the same thing again, they're not gonna be able to guarantee you your first preference. It's based on where you preference it in combination with where you're ranked with your uh, entry criteria. Cool. So then interview. So they basically treat GPA and CASPER results as a hurdle at this particular stage. It's 50% CAMSAT and 50% portfolio results go into the consideration for ranking for interview. Um, then they offer interviews. They say that they did 100, about 160 interviews for the 2022 entry cycle. So they're using that kind of two to one ratio of interviews to actual offer places. And then finally, it looks like they just do a formal interview rather than an MMI, but don't quote me on that. I just couldn't find any information on the website that suggested either. So normally when it's MMI, it states it very clearly. It didn't mention it in the GEMSAS guide either. So I would assume that it's more like a formal or a traditional kind of interview. It doesn't sound like it's a panel interview though. It sounds like one interviewer. Then offers, they change up the way they weight things again. So now um, your CASPER result actually comes back and does actually factor into the final offer rankings. So they then look at your interview, your CASPER results and your portfolio as a 33, 33, 33 split. So equal weighting between the three. Your GAMSAT no longer matters for offer anymore. It's only used for interview. And your GPA also remains just the original hurdle. So those two kind of drop away over the process. And it's just your interview, CASPER results and portfolio that factor into the final offer ranking. If you're in your final year of studies and you've gotten a conditional offer, how does it work with the GPA? Basically, you need to maintain your GPA above the minimum 5.5 to hold on to your offer. You don't necessarily have to maintain the GPA you had at time of application. So it's a lot, lot nicer. It's a lot more reasonable. So long as you don't fall below 5.5, you keep the offer and then you're good to go. Obviously, the other thing as well is you have to graduate by the 31st of December in that application year. If there are any delays, that could stuff things up as well, obviously, but that's pretty rare. And then if you're an international applicant, then you apply direct to uni, not through GEMSAS. Uh, and it also says as well that applications are actually kind of processed on a rolling basis from January of 2022. So they may already be open now. Don't really know how they do it on a rolling basis, but if you're an international applicant, then you should be able to get in contact with the uni themselves and you can probably start putting your application together right now. So anyway, that is everything. Um, hopefully that's all been helpful. I said that I would kind of run through my thinking on whether or not I'll apply. The main reason why I'm thinking that I won't apply is just because it is a rural setting and it is a rurally focused program and it's trying to get people into rural healthcare. And truthfully, that's not really something that actually uh, excites me all that much. And I have to be really honest about it. I think that rural healthcare needs to be improved and it's good that all the medical schools are trying to increase the uh, representation of rural applicants in all the programs. So for me, realistically, I don't think that I would full-time commit to a career in rural medicine, which would mean that I would effectively be wasting one of those places that would be better served by someone who was actually fully committed. Um, I have options at other places too. So for me, it's just more of a, to me, I feel an obligation to not take up a place that I may not actually make full use of um, if I'm really more interested in practicing in a metropolitan setting. That's my main reason. Obviously applying there, I would potentially be competitive because my GAMSAT would help with interview, uh, but then it would disappear when I go later into the process if I was to get past, if I was to get to the interview phase. So I don't really know where I stand in terms of competitiveness. It would have to kind of depend on waiting to see how something like an interview would go if I was lucky enough to get one. Um, and so in that way, that's what kind of entices me towards it. But I think at the moment, I'm probably on the side of going, I'll let that one sit. I might go through the application process to learn a little bit more about it. But um, realistically, I don't think that I would be taking an offer. So even still, I may not even actually do the application because I wouldn't want to, I guess, throw off their admin or anything or take up an interview spot that someone else really deserves. Um, if either Wollongong is their only chance or more importantly, if they're a rural applicant or even a domestic uh, metropolitan applicant who's looking to move and actually commit to rural medicine. So that's my main reason behind it. Um, I think at the moment I'll probably end up focusing more on the other GEMSAS schools along with Sydney and Flinders as well. Cool. Anyway, hopefully that was all helpful. Hopefully it cleared a few things up about the process for the University of Wollongong. That now wraps up all of the GEMSAS schools, which is pretty cool. Um, we've pretty much gone through all of them. 
Uh, next up is going to be University of Tasmania because they've just very recently for 2023 entry opened up graduate entry, uh, a graduate entry pathway into their MBBS. Uh, so it's still an undergraduate level medicine degree, but they've opened up a graduate pathway into it, which is brand new. We'll be going through that next week. And then we'll eventually get to Monash University as well. Obviously, they're in non-GEMSAS. I'm leaving that off because that is really only for Monash graduates. So it's a very, very small cohort that this would actually be relevant to. Um, the other one is technically a GEMSAS school, I believe, and that is Bond University. But um, I've left that off and not prioritized it because their degree is the most expensive in the country and it's all full fee like Macquarie was. And uh, so I'll eventually do it but it's really not my priority. And with GAMSAT coming so close, as I mentioned, we'll take a short break from these videos after the UTAS one, and I'll do Monash and Bond after GAMSAT is out of the way. That way then I can focus on my own study and I can also use the weekend videos to put out a little bit more GAMSAT stuff right before the actual exam. Anyway, that's enough from me and I will see you guys in the next video.